All right, three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest. His name is Douglas Thompson. He's from the UK. And we're going to talk about a book that he wrote back in 2013, a book that came to my attention after doing an, another earlier interview about the Profumo, Profumo Affair, or what's known as the Profumo Affair in the UK. The title of his book is Stephen Ward Scapegoat. The subtitle is They All Loved Him, But When It Went Wrong, They Killed Him. And uh, Mr. Thompson's also a prolific writer. He has a number of other books. He just published a book this year titled The Spitfire Girl, Spitfire Girl, An Extraordinary Tale of Courage in World War II. Also, another title is The Hustlers, Gambling, Greed, and the Perfect Con, published 2012. Uh, Secrets and Lies, The Trials of Christine Keeler from 2014, which overlaps with the subject matter of this book. And then... Another is No Handcuffs, The Final War on My War with the Craze, The Friends of Eddie Richardson, which was last year, 2019. Uh, so again, this book is about Stephen Ward that ties into the Profimo Affair. And if anybody has any questions who's listening out there, please just reserve them for you know half an hour, 45 minutes before we kind of get through the preliminaries of the book. But Mr. Thompson, thank you for joining us. If you have if you can tell people who may not be familiar with your background, can you talk about yourself and what led you to write this book? Um, well, strangely enough, it, it, it began in, in America. Um, I was a correspondent uh, in Los Angeles for 20 years um, and did a lot because of the time I was there. I did a lot of Hollywood uh, interviews and I did a few Hollywood books. And I was contacted by um, someone who knew Christine Keeler, who was, ve who was the really the central role the femme fatale, the whole catalyst for the whole Profumo affair, because she was the one who had the affair with John Profumo, who was the Minister of War, and with uh, Eugenie Ivanov, who was a KGB, GRU um, spy from Moscow. Um, but linking them was Stephen Ward, um, who was the most, in inve on investigation, turned out to be the most if not the headline person, the most intriguing of all the participants in the in the whole Profumo affair, which brought down a British government, changed the way society uh, looked to morality in the UK in the in the sixties, um, and the world here in the in the UK really never was the same uh, after the Profumo affair. But um, I became interested. I, I kind of grew up as a as a kid, in a way, listening to, to the newspaper reports and knowing about it, but only vaguely, um, but was intrigued. And the chance, like I was given the chance to, to meet Christine and talk about writing her book, which, um, which was a long time ago, but in the, this was late 90s, I suppose, um, and which eventually I agreed to do, and we did. Um, and then we updated it after Perfumo died. Um, and again, recently, Christine died in 2017. And the, the book was reissued then um, with a foreword by her son, who is now petitioning to get a, um, a pardon for her um, for a perjury charge. He went to jail for nine months for committing perjury during the trial of one of the participants in the Perfumo affair. Um, she was rather, uh, what's the word? I'm going to say manhandled, but she was kind of bulldogged into uh, to lying in court by the police, who said it wasn't a problem and it would help her, help them get um, a criminal, a violent criminal, off the streets of London. So it it's it was um, a, a way around, um, a long way around, really coming eventually coming back to Stephen Ward and doing the book because really i you know i was still fascinated trying to find out more about him and the more you went into it um the more he christine was only one of several women who he tried to but very much like um my fair lady pygmalion he was the the doctor he was a doctor an osteopath and he tried to create stars out of these young girls uh who he he met mainly he would sit in coffee shops uh, in Park Lane in London. And you have to remember, this is a, a London where there's very little traffic, where you can get across the city in 20 minutes 
um, much very lazy, um, not so much cultured, but um, very easy going, very nine to five. People had lunch, afternoon tea. Uh, the pace of life was very slow uh, during the day. What they got up to in the evenings was, you know, it was almost like out of some X-rated movie when you went into it. So it all kind of hotted up in the at night. But Ward would sketch. He was a f fabulous artist, and he would sketch these um, arrows. And, and not really. It was very platonic. Most of the arrangement he had with them, uh, it wasn't kind of sexual. And they became. He just seemed to enjoy being having them on his arm to be go to, to control them, to have this control over them. Um, there's one, a girl called Vicky Ward, who he uh, charmed and then groomed and brought out in society, uh, previous to Christine. And he attempted to do that with an actress called Shirley Ann Field, who at that time was a very big uh, international star, starring with Steve McQueen and uh, Robert Wagner in a movie, Albert Finney. I think she had three big movies at the time of the Perfumo Affair, all running at the same time. So, and he plied her with Coca-Cola, stockings, and um, the promise of, uh, I think it was the promise, she, she, the, the, she was, could rather have beans on toast or stockings. I think that's what she said. But they, they um, the thing with Ward was that he was a snob. He wanted to be part of aristocracy, he wanted part of society. And because he was an osteopath, he and a very good one and very well renowned, he treated some very famous people, uh, including Winston Churchill, um, Prince Philip. He sketched Princess Margaret. He sketched member Avril Harriman. Avril Harriman from the U.S. Yep, from the U.S. The um, I mean the U.S. ambassador. I mean they all. There was a very big um, David Bruce. I think was the ambassador. Was still I think at the. The, the U.S. Embassy in London, very, very friendly with lots of very prominent American uh, residents in the U.K., but also at the same time very friendly with um, some of the Russian contingents and, um, and very taken with the, the, the problems and the impact of the atom bomb and what it, what it could rot on the world. So he... he, he, he became a, uh, I suppose I, his sympathies were we're kind of saving the world, but because of the connections he had, it, it leaked into security, war offices, uh, and a, a very, very uh, messy outcome later on. But that all began at the estate of Lord Astor, who was a very, he was again a, a, a patient of Ward's, uh, and Bill Astor was uh, Lady Astor, the American, the first uh, female MP in the UK. Uh, she became a member of Parliament uh, long before, uh, well, not long, no, not long before, but long, not long after uh, women got the vote. So she was a very, it was a, a real, the Cliveden set was a very influential set of people. And Stephen Ward, through Bill Astor, Lady Astor's son, who inherited everything, had a, a cottage on the grounds, and he used to go there every every free time he had, but mainly at weekends. About a in these days, it would have been about a half hour, forty minute drive from his uh, consulting rooms in Wimpole Street, in central London, uh, out to the countryside. Um, and he took friends with him, including um, the girls he met who he introduced to people like Bill Astor. And Bill Astor was someone who liked to, um, shall we say, frolic with the young girls. There was sort of romantic intrigues there. Um, and at the same time, often these parties, Stephen Ward parties would be going on with the young girls. But at the same time, there would be a very prominent um, visitors to the UK being entertained, you know, presidents of Pakistan or, uh, ambassadors, envoys from here, there, everywhere, uh, at the dinner table of uh, of the Leicester. And it was on one of these occasions in July, 
1961. And this is where the perfume of Ferg does get a little bit confusing because of the time frame, because the the actuality of the of the affair and the public and the kind of public knowledge of it, there is a two two year time gap. So in sixty one, uh, John Prevumo, the Minister of War, and his wife, uh, and many other uh, prominent people are having dinner with Bill Astor. At the same time, uh, it's a really hot, rare, very hot summer's day uh, in England. And Christine Keeler is in the swimming pool naked. Uh, Stephen Ward is sitting there laughing, joking, whatever, by the side of the pool. When Profumo, with Belaster and their wives, walk around, walk through the grounds, hear the, the laughing, and investigate to see who it is. And that's the first time Profumo encounter John Profumo encounters Christine. Um, and she's introduced, hurriedly putting a pulling a towel around herself by Stephen Ward to John Profumo. Um, the next day, Eugene Ivanov, who works out of the uh, Russian embassy in London, is invited by Stephen Ward to visit uh, to visit him at Clifton. So on that Saturday, you've got the Minister of War of the UK, a KGB GRU agent of the Russians, um, Stephen Ward and assorted other people, basically having a sunbathing, swimming uh, by the pool. And that's really where the connection takes place between um, Christine and Ivanov and Profumo and Christine. So the triangle is there then. And that evening, Christine has sex with Ivanov. And within, I think, within, I'm trying to think within six days, she's contacted by Profumo, who is trying to make advances and make a date with her. And eventually, a few days later, their affair begins. So what you've got in secret at that point in 61 is that triangle linking um, you know, security concerns and obviously you know, a lot of flagrant disregard for uh, state secrets right. because um, the John Profumo uh, is, is squiring Christine around and taking her at times to his home and to his office where there are all the red boxes packed full of military secrets. And the I background to it at the time is America and Macmillan, Harold Macmillan, the Prime Minister, are in very, very tense talks about American getting uh, missile sites in Europe uh, to combat, because the Cold War is very, very cold at that point. Um, so you've got all this background to it. And at the same time, there's got a rather frivolous uh, affair is going on. But behind it, there's this rather dark, um, dark thread running. Right. But wasn't Ward, wasn't kind of his entree or entree into the higher echelons of UK society was because he would have these women around. He would have women on his arm. He was pretty much a committed bachelor after having kind of a disappointing love affair. But that was kind of his side into that huge. I mean, I think one of the things that you detail in a fantastic way in the book is that club scene that was taking place in post-war uh, UK or London where these guys were in all kinds of different clubs and, and moving around. And it seemed like these young girls that, that were in these clubs were kind of part of a, the, of a currency almost. Yeah, no, I think that's a good word currency, because I think that it, it, it is exactly that. It's a bit like uh, in the, uh, you know, before drugs and tobacco was the currency in prisons. I think the girls were the currency to the parties. If you, if you turned up with a group of girls, you got in the door as it were. But I think it, it, with with Ward, it was more it was more subtle than that, because they were gorgeous, beautiful girls, and he he kind of, as I say, groomed them uh, in a uh, you know you've we've had the the Maxwell, Ghislaine Maxwell, the Epstein, the girls being groomed for Epstein, Epstein you know being groomed for other people, running and you know that story and scandal has been running you know for for some some many months now at the moment. But it's very similar in a way 
tip of the Perfumo thing because Ward was really was that kind of Epstein figure. He was the one with the girls. So if you were having a party or you were having a weekend, uh, it was good to be around. But the the way Ward had it, they were the girls were around his cottage, on the estate. So it was very easy for the the aristocracy to to move around the estate and just wander over, and suddenly they're being entertained by young girls rather than being sitting in uh, some you know lazy. Um, kind of snoozing in some library in right. the big house, so that that was it. But I mean, and I think I think Ward, he that currency, these girls as currency, was his way to befriend and to be protected and to be elevated by uh, people whom he thought, uh, you know, and I'd argue very wrongly, who he thought was were his betters because they were born um, to title families. Uh, or they were members of the House of Lords, or they were related to royalty. So I said, he, he, you know, Ward came from a um, seaside town in, in England, um, went to a kind of very minor public school and resented that he didn't have a um, classical uh, upper class education. So he had a, 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 a chip on his shoulder in that sense. And I think because of that, he wanted to to get on. He was willing to use the women. Uh, I, you know, I don't think he despised the girls or, or still there. I think I lost you. Doug. Let's see what happened. Um, okay, you're back. I missed you. You kind of blocked out for about 30 seconds there. Sorry. Did I? Sorry. Okay. No, just I was talking well, about the... Murray's Club and how you know the clubs where the you know the um, Christine and had worked with Mandy Rice Davis. And if you look at it with, with our kind of binocular hindsight today and think about it, Mandy Rice Davis was 15 years old when she was in that club. And I think Christine was 17, not even 18 at that point. So you've got young girls parading around pretty much naked in front of, um, you know, leery, what they would see, regard as very old men, probably men in their 40s, um, and, and men in position, you know, in, in high positions in London society, um, going there, and that's where the connections were made. Um, and and he was from what Torque? Is that right? Torque? I don't know how to pronounce right, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he was a vicar's son, so he was from a, uh, you know, his dad was a Christian minister, I think, down there. Yeah. Outside, yeah. so he was definitely much more uh, rural than some of these sophisticated uh, aristocratic types. And I mean, Profumo, he had known Profumo before the 60s. So they had been in those circles during post-war 50s. And Profumo himself was, pos they were thinking that he could possibly may become prime minister in the future. He was. Oh, uh, I think he had, they, 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 I mean, he was certainly within the, the Conservative Party, who were in power, he was certainly the coming guy. He was going to be the one that was going to take over from Macmillan because Macmillan, A, was getting on a bit. Uh, he was older, but he was also off a, that grandee, uh, old-fashioned hunting, shooting, fishing, uh, the grouse moor flavour, which, we, of course, at that point is going out of fashion. The 60s are coming in, and the uh, the Prime Minister looks as though he's still sort of running Danton Abbey. Uh, so it's, it's that kind of... Uh, so Profumo is this very smooth, uh, very slick, very uh, confident... Um, capable, apparently capable man. So he very much was in the, the running. And I think that was part of part of the, the horror of it all for them, for the, the Conservative the Tory party and the downfall of them was that they, they just couldn't believe someone with such a glittering uh, prospects could throw it all away uh, in such a kind of, in a rather seedy fashion, really. Um, but, but Perfumo had got uh, previous 
in that um, he um, he had his stag party in a club called the Eve Club in 1953, and the Eve Club was uh, run by a couple who worked at Murray's Club, which was the kind of prominent one. But the Eve Club was um, described by someone as a sort of um, kind of part of the uh, the canteen for the Foreign Office, because basically you could get you could be sitting there with Judy Garland one night, and opposite her would be Boris from Moscow, the spy, someone from MI5 and MI6, because the, the club was just around the corner from where our MI6 headquarters were. So there was all this um, spy... Intrigue, right? Spy intrigue. versus spy intrigue, yeah. Yeah, all, all going on. And someone like Perfumo obviously knew about it and is walking into it as a young, then as a young MP. So he, he had that kind of rakish, uh, indiscreet, um, wild, uh, and I think probably driven, or that whole attitude of his is driven by, by arrogance of his position. That he, he felt that he, he should become uh, the leader of the, of the UK, be a, a world figure, become a world figure. And, um, and in a sense, Stephen Ward realizing that and anticipating that himself is, is is buying into it and hooking his star to Profumo's star as well interesting and so, he yeah. uh well ward himself also he, he was kind of a he, you can see in the picture here if you're watching on youtube he had this kind of breezy charm very charming guy very affable and really in, in, uh, inserted himself into that world as somebody who didn't really have a family or anything this was kind of his outlet, right? These clubs and the women. Oh yeah, and I mean, he. Uh, interestingly, there was there's another club called Les Ambassadeurs, which was very, very um, popular, and there was a nightclub within that club called Mil the Milroy, and all the everybody from gangsters to aristocrats to government ministers uh, to Princess Margaret. When Princess Margaret went there, the Paul Adams, who was the band leader would play up a song for her and you know and she said he Paul Adam was her favorite band leader and it was a big society thing but someone said to me that Stephen Ward would be there and you'd see him there and be in a crowd of people and then he wouldn't be there but you didn't miss him when he wasn't there and you didn't really he didn't make a noise when he was he was this kind of almost ghostly figure uh, who haunted a lot of that society almost like a Mr. Fix. He was there when he, when people wanted something. He was there as a provider. And that something usually was young girls who he had this great ability to attract. Um, but he, and he always wanted his protégés. Um, Shirley Ann Field told me that um, she was dating some an actor um, and, and who, you know, was pretty much falling in love with his actor, wanted to... And Ward, who had, you know, was friendly with her, I uh, said, oh, no, you must meet the Duke of so-and-so. He wanted to marry her off, and so she would become the Duchess of something because he thought this was the epitome of um, uh, of achievement. With uh, more, you know, A woman couldn't do any better than become a Duchess or a Princess. The fact that she uh, didn't want to do that didn't matter. And so it was a kind of fantasy. He lived a kind of fantasy life. Um or he lived it out. I mean, it wasn't fantasy. He he made reality of, of, of how he wanted things to be. And, right. and then, of course, it all comes crashing down. Right. Because people, people that are a bit, are not as, they don't always play the play the, the story the way you've written it. But he had other women before Keeler. So there was a string of women that led up to Keeler. Keeler ends up in Clive Adin at the cottage. Mm -hmm. Profumo, Astor. Then what happens next after 61? The affair with um, John Previmo uh, goes on for a year or so. Christine is involved in all kinds of skullduggery and various things. But at the same time, Stephen Ward uh, makes it known that to the security services that there is a link between Ivanov and Profumo. The security services then begin investigating everybody, 
including Stephen Ward, and to see, basically, is this a nest of spies? Are they Russian spies? Are they passing information on? Is it going to the Americans? Um, at that point, the CIA, Joseph, uh, Jesus Angleton, in in uh, Washington, is going to bits and pieces because we've had the scandal of Guy Burgess and McLean, who've run right. off to Moscow, having given Cambridge all Five, right? Yeah, Cambridge, yeah five. Cambridge Five, and also the fact that Ang uh, you know the CIA man had been great friends with Kim Philby, who has also vanished. So you've got a whole spy scandal then you've got the profumo minister of war and russians so it's it's all of that is happening as christine's affair with profumo is going on of course the reality of it is that she has only had this one night stand with ivanov but ivanov is very much still around and it, it does get very complicated because ivanov is also the conduit for um a submarine, a spy ring, which is involved in getting submarine secrets uh, to Moscow as well. So you, you've got right. all of that mess happening. You've got the uh, kind of Scotland Yard uh, policemen who, in this case, uh, pretty much are the ones that you see in the movies. They've all got soft hats and moustaches and really don't know what they're doing. It's very, um, it's, 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 it's being fed they're in all different directions. And of course, it's very political. So the Home Secretary is getting on to uh, Scotland Yard. He's getting on to MI5. He's getting on to the special, British Special Branch, who all then come very heavy footed into the affair. And they decide there has to be a fall guy for all this mess, all the supposed secrets, because by then, the newspapers in 61 or 62 are all sniffing around it. There's a blind item appears in a society magazine, which tips people in the know off to the fact that Profumo has been having the affair with Christine. Um, the Labour Party opposition bring the matter up in the House of Commons, which then makes it a matter of privilege so it can be reported in the newspapers without fear of libel actions. Um, so Profumo at that point then goes public and denies that he's having an affair with Christine Keeler. And he goes public in the House of Commons, makes a, st makes a member's statement, which is an official statement, and lies to the House of Commons. Now, uh, you could cut off the head of everybody in the Tower of London, run down Oxford Street, run around Fifth Avenue, down Rodeo Drive, murder everybody, uh, do whatever, you, any crime you can think of. But lying to the House of Commons in those days was the worst thing in the world that anybody could do. Um, and it comes out in a matter of, not too long, a matter of weeks, months, that he did lie. And that's when the whole story explodes, which is the two year gap between the 61 and the, the beginning of the affair. In, 19, in the summer of 63, when um, the whole story blows up and Profumo, res you know, uh, Profumo resigns and the spy chasing really gets very heated up. And Stephen Ward, the focus really comes on to Stephen Ward at that point. I think you wrote in, you know, just a second, but you wrote in your book like every Russian person there was working for the KGB. Anybody... Including even up, anybody sent to London was definitely some oh, kind yes. of spook or spy. So it was definitely a, a haughty yeah. uh, spy versus spy environment. Yeah, I mean, it was at that time the FBI had the FBI had offices in London, and that was the only time they ever had offices outside of the US. I think was at that time. It was because they were all there was so much going on and um, back and forth, and because of Christine. Christine had visited, and Mandy Rice Davis visited New York during this period, between that two years. So the, uh, And there was all kinds of gossip about, the, about her and Robert Kennedy, John Kennedy, uh, all of that involvement, um, and at sex parties at the UN building. So the, the traffic, the kind of um, telegram traffic between... 
the FBI, the CIA, MI6, MI5, when you look in all, it's, it's astonishing. An awful lot of it's redacted, but it's all urgent, urgent director's eyes only, uh, all of this stuff. So they, they were pretty much freaking in Washington um, and in London, and I uh, probably freaking in Moscow as well. But of course, as I said, the big problem was because of all this finding somewhere to put the missiles in Europe, and at the, same, at the time, you've got to remember, everybody's wandering around wondering whether this bomb is going to drop on them and everybody's going to die the next morning. So it's, it's, it's a time when Kennedy's telling people that they, not to go on holiday, but to, to, uh, to dig a, an air raid shelter in your backyard um, in America. Um, and much the same here. So it's, it's, it's very tense. Um, I mean, Ward himself was kind of a, during the uh, Cuban Missile Crisis, he was kind of a back alley or back channel conduit, right? Yeah, he tried. I mean, Ward, Ward, because of how he saw himself in society, thought he could work with the security services and approach them and went through uh, Lord Aaron, who was a very well thought of um, government minister. And but through him, he tried to uh, basically... He was trying to stop the uh, the deployment of missiles, not the much the deployment, but the positioning of missiles in Europe because he was very fearful of the bomb. So he, he got involved in the um, dealings, um, much to the distress of the security services, with um, uh, with the high politics of it all. So I think the the his um, uh, his position, and he whether and at that point. Ivanov, the spy, uh, I think, convinced Ward that he should try and push for this. And I think he was working on behalf of Khrushchev's interests. He was being fed by Ivanov a dialogue um, that he should take to the, the UK masters that be that was pretty much um, edited down from, the, from Moscow. So there was a lot of suspicion about Ward, about his motives by the security people here but i think in, in all when you look at it i think he was doing it rather naively in what he thought was the best interests of humankind but at the same time being used as a pawn um by in, at the time would have been very much the biggest enemy god he kind of had this idea i mean you write about in the book that he was kind of above the law due to his connections that he would never be arrested mm -hmm. right so he would never yeah. kind of okay. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, he, as I say, I mean, he had a, he had an exhibition of his drawings, uh, which uh, Prince. I mean, I think about the only royal he didn't draw was uh, was the Queen herself, but all the other members of the, the royal family, he'd done portraits, uh, but his name, kind of, uh, fell so much in currency that when the exhibition was on someone secretly came in and bought all the drawings and took them all away, all the originals. Um, that somebody was Anthony Blunt, who was the keeper of the Queen's um, pictures. So he was a very big art historian expert, um, very close to the Queen royal family. And of course, he turns out eventually to be a, a member of the Cambridge spy ring, the, you know, one of the more prominent spies of all time, as far as we were concerned. Um, so Ward is, is dealing with people who are so duplicitous um, that his naivety really comes through here because he believes basically everybody will support him. All the friends he's made, all the connections through the clubs, all the girls he's supplied to um, Bill Astor, and all the other members of the Thursday Club, who included, you know, prominent entertainers, prominent uh, politicians, um, members of society, but one by one, they all just walked away from him. Uh, Bill Astor took back the key, you know, very apologetically, took back the keys for the cottage at Cliveden, and he was kind of hung out to dry uh, by society, and then at that point. Um, the police, at the instruction of the Home Office, um, put the heavy arm on Christine Keeler, 
and on Mandy Rice Davis. Uh, they pulled Mandy Rice Davis into their into a little cell and gave her the third degree. And her crime at that point was that she'd missed paying a rental payment on her television set, which doesn't sound too criminal. Um, but they took, you know, they they took statements from her, which implied that she had been sleeping with people for money in Stephen Ward's flat. Um, indeed, and in fact, indeed, Mandy had. I mean, Mandy, Ma Mandy, unashamedly was taking uh, taking cash off people, and uh, made no bones about it. Um, and similarly, they brought Christine in, and kind of tarred her with that same thing. And she again, it was it was it was very much set up, but they were set up by the police. So they were brought into court to give evidence when charges were brought against Stephen Ward after living off immoral earnings, basically that he was a pimp. So here is a man who hobnobs with the, uh, the gentry, the sophisticates, the aristocracy, but thinks they're all his friends and he's a member of it. And he's suddenly hauled into the old Bailey, um, the great criminal court in the world for all to see and charged with living off immoral earnings and being a very, you know, very unpleasant CD character. But um, he didn't really have that kind of, I mean, according to what I read in your book, he didn't really have an overwhelming amount of money for somebody who was supposedly involved in criminality. It seems like he kind of just lived Well, that, that it. was the whole point. The thing is that he, these girls were living with them. They gave Stephen Ward more money than he gave ever gave them because they would pay, they'd pay for the, you know the, the the electricity they pay bills and so on um so it was it it was um you know they were the ones that, <laughs> he was kind of um supporting them and they would pay back um you know kick in towards the bill for this or that there certainly wasn't any you know lavish amounts of money um that he was making out or he wasn't making money out of the girls there's no question of it um but it was a charge that they could they could certainly parade. And what they did was because Stephen Ward had involved himself with all these other women and set them up, and many of them were prostitutes, and, he, uh, and there had been situations where he'd introduced them to other people purely on a, a, a convenience, a, as a favour, not, not for any profit. But, of course, they were able, again, to put the heavy arm on some of the, these girls who came to court to say that that's, that he was there, that they had had sex for money at his behest. But of course, they were doing that because the police had said they would charge them and put them in jail. And some of the women had young children, single mothers. They, they didn't want that. So they, they gave evidence. And the way it works here, or what, what then in the court system, there is a preliminary hearing where that evidence is to given. And that evidence is not given in camera. So it's it's like a grand jury in America, but all the evidence is made public. So all of that was made public before the big trial itself. So Ward's reputation is trashed, ruined um, before the big event. Um, and I think at that point, Christine never really got over having, having been part of having to give evidence, which turned out to be evidence against Stephen Ward, who she, she never, she got upset with at times but always kind of um, looked up to, I think. I mean, I think it was only in much in later life that she reappraised what role he had played. But um, so Ward was set up at this, um, um, this old Bailey court. And if you look through the, and interestingly, the transcript of that court proceeding has been locked away, the official transcript, and is not available till... 2046. Wow. And you can, if you go to the archive, as I've done, as many people have done, and you try and find out uh, files uh, pertaining to the Profumo affair, but mainly pertaining to Stephen Ward and the Ward case and Ward's involvement, the involvement of MI5, the FBI, CIA, and everyone else, I think they added another it was locked away for another hundred years in 1974. So, um, unfortunately, I don't think you or I will be around possibly when 
when the when the real job comes out. So it's 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 just so. <clears throat> But uh, Ward himself had to have so much material dirt or whatever you call it, compromise or whatever on yeah. all of the elites there. So they were probably very nervous people when he got arrested. There was all of that. There was a lot of burglaries. There was a lot of subsequently um, Ivanov, who went, who suddenly vanished from here and went back to Moscow. Uh, he died suspiciously. But apparently, the rumor had it, I mean, I went to Moscow to try and find it. Um, and supposedly somewhere in Moscow or in Russia is um, this compromat, this compromising photographs uh, of, of, of famous people, of you know, famous people in history now uh, in compromising situations and documents um, going way, way back. And that's is either has has been destroyed, or it's in a it's in a file of a, a friend of mine in Moscow took me to a but there's a building in the center, uh, which is the new kind of filing system for um, uh, the the Kremlin, and it's supposedly somewhere in that building on the 29th floor there is a, all these documents. But all those documents. But you there's a couple parts in your book where people had double sided mirrors. There were listening booths at the back of some of these clubs. So who was compiling that information? You know, I don't know, but it seems like there was definitely people trying to uh, keep tabs well, there's on. A lot of, I think there's a lot of, I mean, whether it was all spooks and spies doing it, whether you had the, uh, often it was it was purely from kind of uh, entertainment value, the, the see-through, the kind of orgy type things that happened. Um, a lot of that, strangely enough, there's never been any hint of of filming. It all seems to talk of still pictures, um, and do, which is, is strange. You would have thought, had you know, that there would have been some sort of filming or film uh, of the events, and um, and that doesn't seem to have. Well, if it did, the, the film has certainly disappeared. But the both Stephen Ward's consulting rooms in Wimpole Mews and his. Um, and the cottage when he was still there were both burglarized a couple of times and there were photographs and things taken away. Um, Christine, certainly she lost uh, photographs and letters, mainly letters between her and Profumo, uh, that Profumo had written notes to her. Only one, only one was left and several others were all uh, uh, stolen, vanished. Gotcha. Do you think when Blunt when Blunt bought Ward's uh, artistic repository, do you think that was a part of a cover up? That was the intent is to oh, keep think that was all the stuff he was taking pictures of because he was always yeah. sketching people, the girls and famous yeah. people. Yeah, and I, I mean, there's pictures. I mean, I've got a couple of sketches here that you know he did Christine, Mandy Rice Davis. There's a, there's um, um, uh, there's an old role called Dandy Kim, uh, very nice, it, nice man, but a real role. And he had a lot of the pictures and trying to sell them. Um, so these things, uh, you know, they still have that that value. But I think that Blunt's, um, whether he acted for the royal family knowingly, but for them to take away the the um, the, the, the the pictures, the uh, the exhibition, the drawings of the royal family, or whether he thought that would bring him kudos with the royal family, uh, we don't know. Um, in the Crown television series, which I think, I can't remember now whether it's series two or series three, the Profumo affair is, is pretty much mentioned in it. And they make it up as they go along. Um, and they have uh, Blunt and Prince Philip talking to each other because the inference was that Philip, you know, with some, because he knew Ward, because he knew a lot of the people involved, that there was some conspiracy involving him. Um, so it's it's um, um, it, go, it goes on. I mean, it's and of course the story takes on its um, its own legend, its own myth over the years. Because like the crown interpret it's one way, and it, for a for a new generation, what they see on television becomes the becomes the reality, um, uh, is what they see. But I think the uh, the the reality of it is that. A lot of very prominent people in British society 
and also with a, a big American influx, American links. I mean, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., the actor, um, certainly involved in trying to uh, hush it up. He was certainly involved in sexual shenanigans with Christine and Mandy Rice Davis at the same time with them. Um, you know, there was a menage with them. He was linked into Lord Mountbatten. Um, he was very friendly with Mountbatten. Mountbatten, um, again, is very prominent in the, in the crown. But that's a lot of that, again, is fantasy because um, there was much scandal involving them. So it, it right. goes on. Uh, at great length, and at the centre of it all is Stephen Ward, who meets um, Mountbatten on many occasions, um, and, and and goes to uh, and Mountbatten visits their um, house in a place Kinnerton Mews, just off Kinnerton Mews. There was um, a guy called Barn, who was a photographer, and he had the he was very friendly with Mountbatten, who was Prince Philip's kind of. Uh, father figure, and Barron took the um, uh, photographs, not at the royal wedding, but at the engagement of um, the Queen to Prince Philip. So it's it's all kind of interconnected. Right. And then Barron supposedly took photographs, um, some of the photographs which may well be in Moscow today. So they're all, um, you know, not everything was recorded in one way or another. So was this was the publication of this book, which you published in 2013, did that lead you to the meeting with Christine Keeler and writing that book with her? Is that correct? No, no, it was the other way around. Oh, enough. okay. It was, uh, Christine, I, I, I'd worked with for a long time with Christine. Um, and then the, the uh, we really finished her story. And I just felt that the, the, the Ward story, you know, there's two, you couldn't get all of that into, into Christine's story because it was all from her perspective. Um, because it was her telling her story, as it were. So you to get into the day, it just didn't work. Uh, so all of that material, um, and then of course because I worked with Christine and had um, her blessing, as it were, lots of people from that era were willing to speak to me who would not, right. who wouldn't have talked to me otherwise. They would have and that's in the war book. You reference many people that you talked yeah. to. 2013 yeah. who've been there in the 60s can you talk a little bit about keeler and what she was like and uh what happened to her after this whole affair um well i think the the, the christine's christine was uh quite tragic what happened really because she was you know she was a one of the original i suppose a me too victim in the sense that she was very much um used and abused by the men around her, um, she 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 was a a good time girl, but not in a kind of prostitution sense. It was she was somebody who she she liked to have sex. Would be fair, I think. She went to bed with a lot of people. Um, she liked to have a good time. Came to London as a teenager. Worked at Murray's Club. Meets uh, Stephen Ward. Moves on into that that society but after the scandal she is still very attractive she tries to get into modeling uh, she's kind of kicked back at every move she makes to to further herself uh, as a person um, mainly because she's I think really quite broken um, traumatized or we, we call it post-traumatic stress after the trial she is charged with perjury she goes to jail for nine months um, because of perjury. That perjury charge and the conviction, her son Seymour um, is at this moment trying to have that overturned. And a barrister here has written a um, very full uh, argument for it to happen. And I think that's probably going to be going forward in the next in the next few weeks, months. Um, and there's a good chance of, of succeeding. Um, the Christine's, Christine's life, and I think it, it, she had two marriages, had two sons. She was a very um, determined, um, very focused person. So it's very hard to convince Christine of 
t- of taking an of compromising in any way of taking an easy way out she would always insist that what she said was the truth this is what happened so she wouldn't give herself an easy life or an easy time by compromising saying oh well maybe i made a mistake she was very very um true to what she believed was was the was what happened was the actuality and that that didn't do her any favors she had a very difficult life uh, for many years, um, because she was seen as this, in the, I suppose in the 70s, and even into the 80s, as this scarlet woman, this, um, she became a kind of a shorthand for a moment in, in history. And if, if you look at uh, many books from the, about the 60s, you'll see uh, on the front cover, it will be the moon landing, picture of JFK, and usually there'll be a picture of Christine on the chair, sitting in that famous picture. And if in that picture, she insists that she had her knickers on when the photograph was taken. The photographer insisted that she didn't. She was still arguing about that to up to the, you know, not many weeks before she died. She was still insisting. It's because it was a point of principle on her point that she had her underwear on when she had that photograph taken. So you, and, and you could go to her when we were doing the book, you'd be sitting there and you'd say, well, Christine, this deck doesn't make sense. It doesn't figure in. It can't have been that time. But yes, it was. Yes, it was. You have to go back. And I ended up going to walking around streets in London, looking at dresses, which she swore was that. It just didn't make sense. And you walk around and sure enough, it would be that that, that, that place did exist. And that was the number of the street. She had a phenomenal memory for the locations and where things happened. And she was dogmatic, but um, in later life, um, she came. She came round. She became more, more uh, pliable. And I think what happened was her, her son married, and she had a grandchild, granddaughter, who she doted on. And I think that was that brought life around for her in full circle. Didn't you say at the beginning of the interview that there's uh, there was a purchase of her story or the story of Perfumo Affair that was going to be produced? Is that correct? They, there was a they, her story was a BBC did a um, beginning of this year 2019 a six part drama of Christine's story um, the trial the the trials of Christine Keeler and as I understand it it's just been it's being bought and going to be seen in America uh, very shortly I would think oh interesting uh, I'll keep an eye out for that um, great uh, do you have a a minute to take a few questions from the audience. Sure, of course. We're at about 52, 52 minutes. Somebody asked, I think, earlier, how close, if you can see on the screen, how close was Ward to the monarchy is a question. To the monarch? To the um, mon- How close was Ward to the monarchy, I guess? Well, he sat with Prince, he sat with, um, Prince Philip, the Queen's husband, and sketched him, met him on many occasions. They were both members of a club called the Thursday Club, which met in Wheeler's uh, restaurant every Thursday. That's the name. Um, so he um, he drew uh, Princess Margaret. He knew Lord Snowden, Margaret's husband. So he, he was. He, he certainly mixed in that circle. Yes, very much so. And of course, through being an osteopath uh, and society osteopath, it's like Avril Harriman, you know, the, the American ambassador, people like that. They would all, he was very renowned. Um, one of the guys, I met a guy, um, he really was, he was a, a, a very much a playboy, but very, very tall man. And he'd had bad had problems with his back all his life. And he said, well, after one session with Ward, and he continued to go to him, he, he didn't cure him, but it alleviated the problem, the pain that he'd had pretty much all his life. So he was good. He was good at what he did. Right. And, um, Let's see. I mean, you've written all these other books. I'd love to have you back on and talk about it. But somebody yeah. asked your knowledge about uh, Hollywood. It was the question is it's a little off topic. Any horror stories, personal encounters of Hollywood? Horror. I mean, if I told you, I might get. No, I may get. I'd be in the courts if I told you the truth about all the Hollywood okay. horror stories. Because you did um, write a book about Clint Eastwood too, right? I do, yeah, I did. Um, yeah, Clint. Yeah, yeah. No, he he was great. No, I, I because of as I said, I'm working in magazines and things. 
Um, no, I interviewed him many times, and um, I spent a couple of weeks in Carmel with him when he was running for mayor, which was great fun. Um, That's great. And all, all, you know, all of that. And um, no, I was lucky because in the in Hollywood, in the um, when I went there in the seventies, um, you know, there wasn't. Uh, for, as far as Britain was concerned, there, there wasn't fax machines. There wasn't, uh, we, you know, I had a I had a telex machine, which maybe I'm, nobody remembers, but they were they chatted away, and you had a long piece of uh, telex paper, which if you broke, you had to be able to fit it together again uh, with a piece of. Uh, I used to use old bits of sellotape. I'm sure it wasn't te very technical, but or you had to write another thousand words. It was so we used to. And if that broke me down, I used to end up having to go downtown Los Angeles to the Western Union. And the guy never liked to see me because he had to sit there in the middle of the night because of the time difference, filing these masses of things rather than sending 20 bucks to, to Harry from Auntie Maisie. So, but it was it was a good time because you'd go to um, interviews. Uh, Angie Dickinson, I, some the guy took me to her home and said, you know, we'll come back in an hour and so on. And she rang him and said, no, we're getting OK. And you're there for the day and you're talking and you're interviews. And, and it all changed much later on when you had to have, I don't know, you know, the, in the sort of Tom Cruise era of today, you probably got 12 publicists having to sign off on whether you can have an 8 by 10 black and white picture of them or something. But in those days, um, you know, John Waynes, the Kirk Douglases, Gregory Pecks, people like that, um, they kind of would take your tape recorder from you and walk around with it and speak into it. Uh, you know, they, were, they didn't have to make an impression. Um, I think how long, how long were you in Los Angeles for? How long were you in the States? Ooh, about 22 years. From... 22. Oh, so you were here for it sometimes. So yeah. you makes the, yeah. I mean, I, how many total books have you written? Cause was it was eight that I saw on Amazon. Is that correct? Say, say again. Do you recollect how many books you've written? I thought I saw eight on Amazon. Um, about 30, I think. 30. Okay, so you don't have all your books on Amazon. Uh, they might not be on .com. I think they're all on .uk. But oh, that's probably that's my mistake. I should have checked the UK. Um, so uh, people can check. Can... It should be on .com. It's, just, it's Jeff Bezos. Is, you know, he's trying to save money or something. <laughs> so where can people buy the book? Where's the best place to, place to buy it? Do you have a website I, or is it Amazon? I'm okay. a, Amazon is probably the best <clears throat> book, so yeah. But it's um, no, it's out there, and I think it, I think it's online too. It's it's it, you know it's on it's an ebook as well, so it's it's out there. But the the Christine book they reissued too is, it, and it, it's it's almost it's they're they're kind of like partners in a way too because they they do dovetail with each other. Right. But the um, um, I, you know, there's a lot. It's it's a fascinating era, and the the Hustlers book again. Because that's the sixties. There's some of the other, the player that was also ongoing at the same time, but that was to do with the underworld and basically at certain points you had uh, the guy who well I always was amused by he sort of owns Lancashire, which meant he owned the city of Liverpool and most of this most of the thing. A man called David Stirling who owned most of the Scottish Highlands, and they were gambling their estates. Um, nightly playing chemi de fer illegally in these illegal gambling games in uh, in Mayfair in hotels with these uh, with rogues, real rogues, but they, they were very clever rogues. Um, right. and I think I think David Sterling eventually said he lost most of Scotland at the card wow. table. So wow, you had a, it was a very um, fascinating period of history. Um, it, it's a bit like when when I was in Hollywood, I was fascinated by the, 40, the 30s and the 40s, but the 40s mainly because it seemed so glamorous and so much was happening. And again, in that post-war era, um, when everything was changing. But of course, the, the, the characters then, when you're younger and you're living there, uh, they all seem so much more glamorous and more uh, out of this world than, than today. I mean... Kind of look at um, prime ministers and presidents today, and you think, yeah, they're not, you know, uh, they just don't, they, they don't, they don't have that kind of um, charismatic um, panache or something, or yeah. like, kind of color thing. You don't say, you know, you don't really 
want to make an appointment to see them. And I always think it's like something like the, the Eastwood movies. Um, you know, he did used to do a, you know, a movie every two or three years. And it was an occasion when somebody appeared, when a, a movie appeared. Um, like a lot of the, I think a lot of the, the older style stars, it was an event. Whereas now it's, it's, it's a kind of manufactured event when things happen. Um, but I, again, I think it's basically we expect events every five minutes in our lives because life's moved to that much higher speed now. Mm. Right. And and for people who are interested in reaching out to you, do you have social media, website, or email, or do you have anything you'd like to share about contact no, information? I think, well, I'm, I'm, I'm at Dougie Thompson on Twitter. Hey, at Dougie, D-O-U-G-I-E, Thompson with a P. Great. At Dougie Thompson on Twitter. Great. And is there anything you'd like to add or any projects or books that are coming up? So the best place to get your books, if you're in the UK, is Amazon UK. So I should have checked that. But uh, yeah. anything uh, else that you'd like to add? Yeah, and only you look out for the Marla Monroe book next next summer. But um, can't say, that, but say that title again? No, it's a book on Marla Monroe coming out next summer. But um, that's um, uh, so you can look forward to that. And um, a, couple, oh, and a, a couple of other things, but they're all... Uh, they're all sort of being written as we speak, so we'll wait and see how they how they pan out. I think. Gotcha, but the Marlon one will be. Yeah, I think Marlon you Monroe. you probably will want to have me back on for a chat after that. One. I think I think I'd love to talk with you about Hollywood. If you were in LA for twenty two years, I bet you've got some great stories. So, uh, I think the guests, I mean the audience here, really loved listening to you talk about your book. Again, the title of that book is Stephen Ward Scapegoat. They all loved him, but when it went wrong, they killed him. There's tons of information. Mr. Thompson's an excellent writer, gets a lot of details about uh, post-war London that I really enjoyed reading. So thank you so much for sharing your time with us. No, it's lovely. Thank you. I appreciate it. All right. Me. All right. Thank Thanks, you. Mr. Thompson. Have a great day. End the broadcast.